Hello, everybody, um, to this month's uh, Tile Network meeting webinar. Um, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Till McKay. She's a lecturer in veterinary science education at the Royal School of Veterinary Studies. And her research interests um, lie within research methodology, and she explores how students learn in digital environments, something very important and pressing at the moment. So that's great that we have her to, uh, to give a talk today. Um, she also likes to play video games herself, so you can see her pictures in her uh, bio here. And um, without further ado, um, I would like to um, welcome you and um, we start your presentation on forcing around playful learning in the veterinary curriculum. Did you change the title of your talk? Wasn't it playful learning in professional degree forcing around with next students? Uh, it possibly was. The, the, the talk possibly was cribbed from a previous version of the talk given at another conference. Uh, I plead the fifth. Uh, so yeah, my name is Jill Mackay and I'm going to talk to you about an initiative that we've done at the Royal Dick School of Veterinary Studies to try and introduce a bit more playful learning into uh, what is at times a very stressful degree programme and a degree programme with a lot of professional accreditation necessities. So if I can uh, make my slides work properly. So horsing around, it's more than just a little pun in the title. We're going to go over uh, three aspects of this study, what we mean in this context by play, why that might be relevant to learning, and then how do we implement that in a professionalised setting and why we might want to consider how a professionalised setting may or may not be appropriate or playful learning may or may not be appropriate in a professionalised degree. I also just want to put a little content warning on here. Uh, I'm going to be talking about plagues and failing to contain them uh, in the context of a zombie apocalypse and I just want to make you aware that I will be talking about uh, some disease spread and things like that. If that feels a little bit too much for uh, current circumstances I'm not going to be offended at all if you decide to head off so please don't worry. Um, okay. I normally start this presentation with a video of playing. Uh, I usually start with the video of my kina, and this is when she was a little kitten many, many years ago. And the reason why I start off with a cat is because kittens are a really interesting example in animal behaviour of when play shows a very strong adaptive quality. Kittens which are born in suboptimal environments where food is scarce or where resources are challenging to obtain will show more play behaviours earlier than kittens in relatively resource rich environments. And the reason for that is because it helps them hunt and play is the way that they get to hone their practice and become better environment that they're going to go into. Playfulness is something that is prioritized even in challenging environments. I started out as an animal behaviour um, researcher uh, some time ago now and my initial concept of play came from the animal behaviour literature. In behavioural ecology we consider play as a bit of a, a complex thing, it's something that's very difficult to identify and difficult to study. Uh, Beckhoff has a great uh, phrasing of it as a vague word that is used to describe a wide variety of motor patterns which is uh, something that could really be used to describe almost any behavioural pattern or suite of behaviours. We do recognise though that play certainly in animals and in young animals fine tunes the development of skills and it also has a really good um, uh, capability to reinforce social bonds particularly in animals where there may not uh, always be good opportunities to socialise, such as animals which are independent, like cats, for example. 
And in animal behavior, we have this very common phrase that you will know play when you see it, which we say quite glibly because it's very difficult to define in a standard way. When we talk about play in humans, there's this really good definition from Gordon, which is a little bit fluffier and a little bit more conceptual. Play is the voluntary movement across boundaries, opening with total absorption into a highly flexible field, releasing tension in ways that are pleasurable, exposing players to the unexpected and making transformation possible. Transformations occur as frames by associate and the parts and the whole interpenetrate, increasing the differentiation of the part, the integration of the whole and the rate among them. Now, if that feels impenetrable to you, there's a couple of aspects of this definition that I really like. One of the things that I think this definition um, pulls up really nicely is the voluntary movement across boundaries. Play is something that to explore avenue we wouldn't necessarily explore. We see this very often in animal play where animals will willingly put to be in. For example, they might flip onto their backs and pretend to be disadvantaged in a mock fight to test how they would get out of being in that fight later. And the other thing that I really like about this definition is it's the release of tension in ways that are pleasurable. Play has to be fun for it to be play because that thing allows you to explore new avenues that you maybe wouldn't have explored before. So when we're talking about play, there's then a question, does a structured activity like this count? So this is an escape room uh, with myself and some friends. This is one of the only times we ever made an escape room uh, leaderboard. We're really bad at them <laughs> in a very depressing way. And I think we can try and apply Gordon's definition to this very structured activity. We were moving across boundaries. We were voluntarily confining ourselves into a room. We could have at any point changed that and left the room. We weren't really locked in. We were voluntarily imposing some boundaries and exploring what was happening within those boundaries. Room. We could have done lots of different puzzles. Uh, we could have had lots of different uh, groupings no. in the puzzles, but no. we chose one particular path. And if we'd done it again, we might have done. Oh, uh, so yeah. the connection is really bad. I wonder whether. Are you there? And, is that it? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm just saying that the connection is really bad. So I wonder whether you want to turn. I off. will stop my. Yeah. Right. Let's try that. Great. So shift folks set up and uh, yep. it, is, it exposes players to the unexpected. Are you there, Caroline? Ooh. Yeah, it's still a little bit messy, and but just yeah. Hold on, I'll see if there's anything else I can close on my laptop. <laughs> I'm not sure there is, unfortunately. Um, and it allows for transformation. We may not necessarily always take on the same roles as we go through the, uh, the uh, um, the scenario. So, uh, okay, so um, if you could bring um, thing, okay? No, it's not really working, so we can't really understand you. Is it just me, or is it basically everyone else as well who has a hard time understanding Jill? Yeah, I can't if it's cutting out as well. Okay, so what we can do, Jill, maybe um, I have your slides. Maybe I can share the screen or so. Yeah, um, that sounds good to me. Let me see. Um, I 
I don't know if it makes any difference, but um, let's just give it a try. Let's give it a go. <clears throat> so if you stop sharing yours. Okay. I'll, yep. All right, and let me see. Can you all see? Yep. Okay. Maybe you start with this slide again. <laughs> um, uh, we'll jump on to the next one, if that's all right. okay. All right, because we didn't hear really this one, so. That's well, this is basically all we're saying with this one is that uh, we're exploring the definition of play. We're interested in moving boundaries. We're interested in exposing players to things that they might not expect and transforming their experiences. Next slide, please, Carolina. Thank you very much. So with our veterinary students, we wanted to provide an opportunity for them to fail safely. Failure is a real concern uh, in the veterinary curriculum because they will experience failure. All good vets will at some point lose a patient very often because of something they have done. And that is not a reflection of them not doing something well necessarily. It's just a reflection of the difficulty of working in a clinical environment. And we also know that there are a lot of mental health challenges within the veterinary profession. So we wanted to explore an opportunity to give them some fail uh, some experience of failure in a safe environment so they could build up some resilience. We also wanted to give them opportunities to explore their own morality. Vet students are very often um, highly driven and without necessarily a full understanding of alternative points of view. They very often have a sort of I am definitely right and this is the one way to do this and that doesn't always um, translate very well to a clinical setting and we wanted our students to have a little bit of fun particularly in first year veterinary school is a big transition it's something which is very stressful and everything feels very very important all of the time we really liked the magic circle theory, which is an idea that play allows for students to, or players, to enter a magic circle where rules do not directly apply and you can explore different states. There's also this idea of failure being of high consequence and low consequence. And the more low consequence failures you experience, the better your ability to deal with the higher consequence failures ends up. And hopefully you should have fewer high consequence failures because you've learned from the low consequence failures. Next slide, please, Carolina. So we wanted our students to have fun. We wanted them to explore ethical conflict in a controlled setting, and we wanted them to experience low consequence failure. So we decided to design a scenario where they would play, where they would experience failure and ethical conflict, and hopefully they would respond to the scenario that we gave them in a positive way. Next slide, please. We marketed this to the students as a negotiation skills session. We have 100 first year students, roughly, and we break them into four tutorial groups. So we knew that to fit into our timetable, we needed to have a scenario which would work between 20 and 30 players. We knew that all four groups would have to receive it at once because there was a lot of secret information in the game. And so we run a session usually in November, where we break the first years into four groups and in their four lab groups, they each run through this single scenario. Everyone in the group gets a role, they get a pack with a title and a personal goal. They're told that the overall goal of the game is that the town of Roslyn must survive a zombieitis attack. And they are also told that they have a personal goal which they must try to achieve, but that other players in the room may have personal goals which are directly contrary to their personal goal 
or which is the same as their personal goal and only one player can achieve it. So they have to be careful what information they share. We also give each character a piece of information or a piece of power which is of use to the game. The big thing about our scenario is that information is key. So we set students up on five tables based on what their role is and we greatly try to reduce movement between the tables. The failure point for the game is if every person is able to clearly communicate with each other, they would very quickly see that the best scenario would be to not to move around at all, ironically enough. And they should all remain where they are to see where the zombieitis infection comes out. But because we have restricted the flow of information and we have told people that they have personal goals that they have to achieve, students begin moving between the tables very quickly. Next slide, please, Carolina. This is an example of a briefing that the doctor role would get. And one of the things that you might pick up on this straight away is there is a lot of information contained on this slide. One of the aspects of this game that we really like is that we flood the students with information. When they end up going to a clinical setting in a couple of years time, they will find themselves flooded with information and they find that very stressful and they complain that they haven't been prepared enough for it. So what we wanted to do was give them a huge amount of information to process very, very quickly in a situation that doesn't actually really matter or has that fun environment around it. So each um, character gets a briefing in this one, uh, the doctor is told that they are responsible for the good health of everyone in Roslyn. Everybody gets a piece of information. In this one, they're told, uh, the doctor gets told the um, infection rates and also the sensitivity of the test. And they also know that um, there is one character highlighted, Doctor Two, who has not been uh, vaccinated in the appropriate time frame. So these are students who, although they are not, they have not received a lot of um, medical and epidemiological training at this point, they are going into a veterinary degree. So we do expect that they would be able to see in this uh, sheet that we have one character who is not covered by the vaccine and so should not be moving at any point. And one of the things that we can point, we try to point out with every single briefing is a piece of information that that character could have used to identify that nobody should be moving around in the room. Could we nip to the next slide, Carolina? Thank you. This is the supplies officer. So to show you a different um, version of the, of the character, the supplies officer doesn't have medical knowledge, but they do uh, know that they are not vaccinated, that they feel healthy right now. And they are, their personal goal is to convince the doctor to vaccinate them. There are only three vaccines in the room and um, I think there's five characters that, were, that want to be vaccinated. So there's a lot of different opportunities for students to try and convince each other why they deserve the vaccine that they need or why they deserve to move tables or why they deserve to be promoted. There's a variety of different personal goals. Uh, next slide, please, Carolina. We've done a bit of an evaluation on this. So we have a student research project which did some pre, post and retention questionnaires. And we've also run some qualitative interviews and uh, focus groups with staff to explore what actually students were feeling and thinking and how they responded to this playful scenario. Next slide, please. So what do we see? This is an example of a letter which uh, one student sent to another student on a different table during their game. Dear doctor, 
I am a suppliers officer who has a crucial role as resources are limited and I am the one who contacts travellers and traders to ensure that sufficient food and vaccines for the people trapped here. Thus, it's important that I do not get infected by the disease. Please allow me to get a vaccination as I play a critical role and I must be protected from the bacteria or everyone will starve and die. Thanks, suppliers officer. So during the game, we see lots of letters like this being transferred between tables by a few characters who have the power to move between uh, the different tables or offices. These characters are the security guards generally, and they are the key information distribution mechanism of the game. In the first iteration of the game, we found that our security guards felt that they didn't really have much to do and they were just, because um, one of the other things the security guards can do is help, trans is help walk a character from one table to another. And so in the second iteration of the game, taking our cue from the veterinary oath, which they would swear in graduation, we had the security officers stand up and swear an oath to the mayor of the town that they would behave responsibly and protect Roslyn. So the security officer has delivered this letter from the supplies officer to the doctor character. And one of the things that the security officers know is that the bacteria spreads on saliva. So there are lots of little uh, failure points throughout the game. But one of the things that is nice to see in these letters is that we do get a little bit of role play and exploring uh, the role that they were given, even if it's not necessarily a role that they would have chosen. I should have said the roles are all uh, randomly assigned. Next slide, please, Carolina. We have some more um, uh, evidence of play. So this is another exchange from two players uh, who were passing notes back and forward. Uh, player one who had power in this instance of whether or not a character was allowed to transfer tables is asking, why do you want to move? Smiley face. Uh, player two says, I need to have a vaccine. I have puppies. Smiley face. And then player three, who somehow intercepted this uh, series of letters, is interjecting that there are no vaccines. Something that's really cool about this is that player three is deliberately misleading players one and two because player three had knowledge of the vaccines. But in this particular instance, the table that player three was on they decided to keep all the vaccines to themselves and to vaccinate all of the medical staff because they were the medical table and uh, not inform the rest of the town. I'm kind of interested at this point what your thoughts are on some of the ethical issues that are coming up in here because as I'm going over it I'm thinking how very apt some of it is to our current sitting, which I hadn't really thought of when I was preparing these slides. Um, but I'm interested to see, do you see the sort of the ethical um, environments? So Kieran's asking, uh, competition is modeled and not cooperation. Could students generalize from that to real environments? We present students with a, um, a video of myself standardizing why we're giving them the negotiation game at the beginning of the game. And in that game, we say that negotiation is about, um, I can't remember exactly how we phrase it, but we essentially say that sometimes you'll be in a position where you want something that somebody else wants or your, your wants and needs will be opposed to one another. One of the things that we see particularly in our early years vet students is that they are very idealistic and they talk about how everybody will want to work together and nobody would ever, um, for example, uh, prescribe antibiotics badly because everybody is aware of antimicrobial resistance. And they refuse to accept alternate points of view or they struggle to accept alternate points of view. So we try to force competition in the game, mainly because that's the easiest way to fail, is to ensure that the students themselves are sabotaging each other and the failure is the big thing that we're trying to get to. If everybody cooperated, the game would fall apart. Um, next slide, please, Carolina. Uh, 
Uh, so Emily's saying, I like that there's an aspect of what will be perceived as unfairness and potentially unethical behaviour. Even for non-professional degrees, we hear much about how so many things are apparently unfair, and this is a good way of exposing them to that. We really talked a lot about the ethical conflict that we were putting in here because there are, within um, veterinary degrees, there are many um, places where you have to think about what do you think is appropriate and what do you want to do and what can you do and coming into conflict with people with different ethical opinions that comes into animal testing it comes into what kind of treatment you would be prepared to offer an animal it comes into even how people manage their animals and whether or not you agree with that and we really wanted to explore that unfairness particularly because sometimes an animal will die and you can do absolutely everything right uh, and that animal will still die and the unfairness of that and the challenge of that is something that we really kind of wanted to explore in a, in a safe way and in a nice way and in a way that at the end of the day the students could walk away with a smile on their faces and maybe just come back to it when they end up in that situation in real life. We did see some really interesting examples of ethical conflict. So this is two um, notes that we have. We have a promotion form so the mayor, uh, sorry the the human resources manager is able to change people's roles within the game and it's usually a promotion form. We have in this case uh, on the right hand side the Roslyn Employment Services form. Uh, James has been demoted. He was originally the judge and he was demoted to the concerned citizen role because the uh, HR manager did not agree with the judge's ruling on a case. And what was really interesting about this particular scenario was there's a couple of different story strands that any one room can go down is we've discovered so we've run this eight times now and we've discovered it's usually best when one particular strand gets invested in this particular group went really heavily down the trial strand which was great but what happened at the very end of that was that there was a little political coup and the human resources manager was then able to promote them uh, promote somebody else and that person became mayor and got vaccinated even though they started out the game as a, uh, a concerned citizen and demoting the judge was a key part of this plan and it was beautifully complex, beautifully manipulative and something that the helpers in the room didn't see coming and uh, a really interesting example of ethical conflict in a group of people who prior to coming in there because they've gotten into veterinary school they would all have said they had excellent ethical standards. And then on the left hand side we have, uh, dear sir or madam, I have been observing and noting down zombie movements and I believe this information can be very valuable to your research. However, the information is written in secret code, hence I am hoping that you will let me in, in into your table to speak about it. The issue with this is that this is an outright lie, there is no information here. Whether or not the student um, is taking a little bit of artistic license and playing with the game or if they actually have written uh, or, or if they're just outright lying to this other person. Um, this is a really interesting example of how the students are beginning to bend the rules and cross those boundaries and think about differences in how they might go about something. Next slide please Carolina. Our student uh, evaluation, so uh, Something that I should have said towards the start uh, was that we have done a lot of this in partnership with students. So we bring our senior year students in to help us run the sessions because we don't have enough staff to run them. We brief the senior year students on what the scenario is and they get to feed into um, different aspects. So they get to feed into why a character might do something. We tweak the scenario each year. And then in the room, the senior students uh, sort of stir the pot essentially and if nobody's doing anything they will go over to that table and say oh why are you not doing this have you considered such and such and they'll be able to cherry pick some pieces of information from the uh, the character packs to try and provoke 
some uh, unethical behaviour. And we had a student who did an evaluation, Katie Stein. Now, unfortunately, she got very poor um, uh, response rate to her retention survey. So in her pre-survey, she got 83. Uh, she asked a post-survey, which is specifically about the game, and then a retention survey, which asked students again to rate their communication skills, their, cope, their ability to cope with failure, their ethical decision-making, and their ability to work in teams. And we don't see any significant differences in how the students felt about their uh, about any of their skills before the game or uh, six months after the game, which is quite interesting. Uh, could we nip to the next slide? We asked the students immediately after the game, how did you feel that the scenario helped you develop these skills? And we see that uh, actually the majority of students don't feel, uh, sorry, I've just realized that the uh, responses aren't coded. One and two are disagree and three and, uh, and four and five are uh, agree. And you'll see that the majority of students actually didn't feel that the game helped them cope with failure or with their ethical decision making, but they did feel it supported their uh, teamwork more. Now we did badge this to the students as a teamwork game and one of the things that we've added since this and in the second iteration of the game is a more structured debrief where we bring all the students together again and talk to them about failure and we use a clinical debrief model to do that so in wards when um, something goes wrong you, or when you're doing a handover to another shift you very often get everybody together and talk about what went wrong and you do this in a non-judgmental way. So we've added this in response to this particular evaluation and we hope that that will uh, support the students ability to cope with failure. But one of the things that is important for us to highlight here is that we're giving students this opportunity because we actually think it's going to support them when they get to their clinical years, which for these students is three years away. So a six month retention survey, uh, while very useful for uh, the student who is doing her research component evaluation, is not actually the time period in which we, the staff developing this intervention, um, felt would be useful because we designed a scenario that would reflect real world clinical aspects and, and challenges and they're not going to see that for some time. And one of the uh, challenges or sadnesses or difficulties of these kind of long degree processes is we really won't see the outcome of this for a couple of years and we're having to rely on our perspective of how we think students are uh, behaving in this game and how we think students are taking stuff away from this game. And it will be a little while before we can really say whether or not it's doing any good in terms of coping with failure and ethical decision making. Next slide, please, Carolina. The student evaluation also asked students what they thought of it. And we got some really interesting responses. So we got students saying the zombie theme was a bit silly. We had students saying uh, when talking about play, play should be used only if it is implemented effectively. I believe there should be a distinction between work and play, and if by implementing play into our work environment, it is not done effectively, it might disrupt our work environment, leading to adverse effects, working less, putting less effort in, etc. And then we had another student saying, I learned more from that one class we had than half my lectures if I hadn't studied. And I do really like the little uh, qualification that they've put on there if they hadn't studied. We got huge amounts of positive feedback from both times, uh, both cohorts, both year cohorts that we've run this session in. The students felt much more bonded after it. They really enjoyed it. They felt that we'd put a lot of effort into the class and they were, even the students who would admit that playfulness wasn't the thing that they themselves would 
you know, they themselves weren't gamers or they themselves weren't people who would do escape rooms and things like that. They found the problem solving aspect of the game and the communications aspect of the game quite enjoyable. We had our staff focus group and one of the key um, observations from the focus group of the staff who helped design the game was that not everyone is going to be in the same place after this. It's a highly personalized learning environment and different groups take different things from the game. Different groups go in different directions. We see really diverse playing styles and strategies. So in the eight sessions that have run, we've not seen any two go the same way. And we've not seen the students respond in a, in a uniform way. And having a playful opportunity in this degree, which is considered very serious for a lot of these students who have worked very hard to get in there, is something that I think we will be having a lot of debate about in future. And I'm kind of interested to kind of get your perspectives on this as well, because we have decided somewhat um, uh, uh, in a, with a superiority complex, I'm not sure what I'm trying to say there, that play is a good thing for our students. And it will be really interesting to see if that does prove true in the coming years. And I'm quite keen to see how uh, the students who are now going through COVID-19 who have experienced this playful scenario, if they pull any reflections from this scenario into their current work. Next slide, please, Carolina. So, should we horse around in the veterinary world? Well, I said that I wanted the students to play, that I wanted them to explore ethical conflict, and I wanted them to fail. Did they play? Yes, I am certain that they played games, that they were able to explore um, some scenarios in a way that was enjoyable for the majority of them. Did they explore ethical conflict? Yes, I think they did. I think we saw examples of cheating. I think we gave students an opportunity to explore something which would normally be very, very difficult for our professional uh, degree students to follow because there are huge consequences to them acting uh, unethically in future. I think we gave them a way of exploring that and seeing um, if it fitted in with their ethical constructs. Did they fail? And this is the one that we really don't have an answer for yet. We've done this with our casual debrief and we've done this with our structured clinical debrief. And both times we've anecdotally received a general sort of meh to the feeling of failure. And I don't know if that is because it's too difficult to generate a failing setting in a playful game if, if the feeling of play means that the failure is neutered or if there is a way of doing this that allows students to have that what in Star Trek fans would call the Kobayashi Maru scenario of an actual real failure that they can then learn from. Uh, next slide please Carolina. So there's just some references to what we were discussing. This is currently under review in the Journal of Adult Playful Learning, I think. I would have to double check. Um, and I'm hopeful of uh, sharing that soon. We do have the pack written up in a way that we can share with others if you would like to explore playful learning in your own environments. I think my overall summary of this is that we see a use for it, but what we, we see that use based on our joint experience, all of us who helped create this, what we know and what we think of veterinary students. And it's quite challenging for us to find the evidence to say this is something that is useful for our veterinary students because we're not going to see the benefits of it for a couple of years yet and that's been really challenging. I suppose what has been 
our big saving grace has been that the students were so positive about the experience they really appreciated having a little bit of an opportunity to have fun in uh, in their degree that um, our head of school now uses a quote from one of the students uh, talking about the zombie uh, game to illustrate how much the students enjoy their uh, time here with us. So that's a very nice little um, plug for uh, doing something a little bit risky in teaching, especially when you've got so much uh, work to, um, uh, so much, when you've got so much to teach the students and the amount of work that you uh, put into developing something interactive like this and trying to decide, is it worthwhile taking two hours out of every single student's um, a day in order to make them do something that in the end of the day might not work. So Helena is saying, I think that not being able to predict the outcome can be seen as scary by teachers. Absolutely terrifying. I have to say the very first time we ran this, I was running a bit like a headless chicken and I've never been so stressed as an educator. But Helena also thinks it's very authentic and a good thing because it allows for the teachers and the students to cooperate in exploring different aspects of this, uh, for example, ethics. Yes. And one of the things that I didn't really emphasize enough in this presentation is the student co-creation that we do within this. We would not be able to run this without our student helpers and each time we've run it, our student helpers are fed into the, um, the scenario, how it's set up and they've made some great brilliant um, opportunities uh, on the hoof. So they've been able to say things like um, you've let's say two students have, have come to a conflict, they've been able to uh, perhaps make a student aware of some information that they weren't previously aware of, or been able to highlight how the students have different options available to them that they might not have originally seen. And it's a huge investment of their time as well and absolutely massively appreciated. Um, Steve Draper is linking to Dewey's uh, version of play and seriousness. I'm not going to open that just now just in case my internet crashes as it seems a little bit unstable but yeah there's lots of um, research out there on playfulness and education and how um, the magic circle or various um, conceptual interplays of how these things come together uh, Kieran says, do ethical decision methods um, of individuals generalize across contexts? If not, the game might not affect choices in VET contexts. So uh, that, that is a philosophical question, which I think we could debate for a long time. The veterinary um, profession has a, an inherent bias there in that it thinks yes, because it believes that it can ethically judge everything that vets do. And there are consequences for behaving unethically, including getting struck off the register. So um, yeah, the behaving ethically and giving students the opportunity to understand why ethical behavior is important is something that we have to do as a core competency in the veterinary degree. Um, and Kieran also says for coping with failure, individual first person video games in a veterinary context where success is impossible. That was the original version of this. Um, so we originally started years and years and years ago um, with, I don't know if you're familiar with Twine, which is a um, uh, like a choose your own adventure. And it was originally going to be, you are a vet in practice and here comes um, an animal in a particular situation. And no matter what, the di what choices you made the animal, you was going to die. And we then sort of scaled that back to try and bring it in earlier into the professional degree by making it about study choices. So will you behave ethically or not during study choices? And then from that, we then essentially, we also, have, we also have a lot of video resources. And one of the video resources we had was a sort of introduction to the clinic environment, which was very overloaded with information. 
which is what the clinical environment is like, but students actually reported finding it incredibly stressful. Um, so we were then thinking about how could we merge the two and then through as many things in a conference possibly over a pint a couple of us ended up saying oh why don't we just do this big massive role-playing thing and then we sort of exploded into into this scenario and once you've booked time in a timetable slot for 100 students it sort of ends up happening whether regardless of whether or not you're ready i still think there's a um a value to a sort of a first person video game style approach but one of the advantages of doing this as a live action role play setting is that for those students who have poor gaming literacy um, they are still able to access this we I, well, so one of the things that's kind of spun out of this is I've been exploring whether or not there's a sort of a playful literacy scale in adults do adults um do adult are some adults just more literate about play and i sort of strongly suspect they are and that that literacy really stops some people from accessing this kind of educational intervention um, Helena says that role play could be about zombie pets. Uh, there is in the scenario one of the characters does have a dog which is trapped outside of the of the town, and uh, it's amazing how many people really manage to get the whole town motivated to find this dog, which is quite fun. Um, how long did it take to set this game up, and how much time do you spend managing the game during the semester? So setting up the original game to a lot of time uh, I, that the design of the game probably took a couple of weeks the original setup of the game took two days and that's including uh, briefing our student helpers the second time we ran it having a more robust pack and me kind of being able to explain it better to other people, uh, we were able to set it up in a day and a half. So, and that includes briefing the people, making sure that all the kit is there, and that's for a hundred people, so four iterations of the game. And then during the semester, we don't spend really very much time managing the game at all. In fact, we had very few staff the last time we ran it. It was mainly student-led. We do have a um, a program that's name escapes me oh my goodness what's it called we have a program where veterinary students um basically work to associate fellow of the higher education academy status um <coughs> using uh so they support they do the, the peer supported learning and they um take on a lesson plan and we use that scheme to uh bring students in Emily asks if we have any plans to release an adapted online version. I'd love to. Uh, we, so um, if we end up all not on campus next semester, um, we will have to consider whether or not this is something that has to be run practically or if there's a way of doing this online. I feel like there is a way of doing it online. I feel like you could probably put people into different discussion rooms and maybe give them like um, an option to send one letter every 10 minutes to the other rooms. Um, I haven't quite worked out the mechanisms of it yet, but the key game mechanic is limiting the flow of information. And as soon as you can do that, if you can create division between people and limit the flow of information, you can create the untrustworthiness uh, that is needed to have the students begin to behave unethically. Do we have any idea on how students with support needs uh, from UTA uh, responded to the game, e.g. with social anxiety or um, spectrum disorders? We ask, so when we set it up, we say to students, if please make, if you're very uncomfortable with the idea of this, please make the student helpers aware and they'll assign you a non-critical role. We've had a few people take that on, but they've then ended up engaging. 
we have quite a um we do not have a diverse cohort as veterinary students go um, they tend not to be particularly uh, diverse and they also often have a lot of coping strategies so we've not received any feedback that is inappropriate the biggest issue that we have is the amount of information that we give students at the start is a bit challenging for those with dyslexia um, and that's partly why we after our sort of very first pilot run through with some um, some more senior students we then integrated the video pre-recorded videos to give students information in a standardized way ahead of time but I think there's definitely accessibility issues with this kind of interactive experience. Are there any other questions? It's such an interesting topic. So um, to do this in a such large scale format would be great. It was a big ask when we decided to do it. It was a big scale uh, project and that's partly why I'm really keen for other people to make use of the pack as well because I'd much rather that, that work be useful for other people um, because that took us a huge amount of time. And I suppose the only issue that we now have is uh, I'm a little bit concerned about whether or not it's appropriate to use this particular scenario this upcoming academic year or if it's going to cut a bit too close to the bone mm -hmm. and I definitely feel actually having gone over the slides today with you folks I'm leaning more towards I think I want to redesign the scenario to be more um, uh, more to be less rem reminiscent of current times shall we say <laughs> So you said you had two times where you assessed um, the different variables, right? So it was one time just right after um, the, the... So we had, a, we had a student project who the very first iteration of the game, so that's four sessions, 100 students, mm -hmm. that student did a pre-session survey, mm -hmm. a immediate post-session survey, which had a different set of questions, and then a post ret a retention survey right. six months later, which okay. had the pre-survey questions again. Right. Um, working with students is brilliant and is definitely something that I encourage for co-creation and things like that, mm -hmm. but um, it is just something to kind of be aware of when you're running evaluations that sometimes you can turn around and go, ah, it would have been, you know, if somebody with more experience had run this evaluation, they might have made slightly different choices. Um, so yeah, that was a learning experience. No, no, it's fine. It's just, um, was, I just was wondering about um, how long the, the period was between um, yeah. the post and the re retention and six months is a long time for people to come back. So that's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, for Jill. So someone said here, uh, Kieran said, redesign sounds like a good idea. Yeah, I think, I think we'll be redesigning. I think it might be something set in space. <laughs> it's quite hard to get away from this of, uh, the public health aspect in uh -huh. a degree. degree. Uh, yeah. But yeah, we might, we might try and soften that a little bit in future. <coughs> If there aren't any other questions, I would like to thank you um, for, for your talk. It was extremely interesting, um, something I have not heard of before. So that's very interesting. I loved it. Uh, and I think um, the question that you got here also um, show you that um, the audience was um, intrigued by, uh, by, by the game that you, that you created by putting this in, into a large scale um, classroom. Um, so that's, brilliant project there. Um, thank you very much. Um, we will be writing a reflection post on this and posting everything on our Tile Network website. And you mentioned uh, some kind of pack that you have, some kind of information or details or whatever material pack. 
Yes, so yeah. we have a we've we've created the game under an open license. So uh -huh. we have a pack, which hopefully means that you should be able to take that download and go and run the game yourself. Whether or not you're able to interpret the pack is maybe not <laughs> totally clear. Um, so I'm really uh, what I'll do is I'll send that along to Carolina and she can uh, share it with yourselves. Yes. And any feedback would be really, uh, really useful for us to have because yeah, it would be such a waste of time if, <laughs> if you know, this. Uh, now that we're going to sort of develop a slightly different scenario, if that would um, not be used in future. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop the recording now.